Thank you, Manfred, uh, for the kind and quite generous introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this is not only my uh, first time to this magnificent city, uh, but also this is my first plenary lecture in a conference uh, promoted by IACM and ECOMAS. So this is actually more than a pleasure. It is an honor to be here. And I truly thank the organizers for uh, the invitation. So uh, I have decided to address here uh, some of the most uh, recent developments, actually to be more precise, some of the ongoing developments uh, in our group within the realm of uh, uh, particles and particle related things. Uh, just a second, of course, cell phone rings an expected time. Uh, I have, uh, for this reason, uh, made a slight change in the, in the title of my talk to better reflect its content. Uh, the price that I had to pay for this is that uh, what I will be showing here are only preliminary results, uh, but I think it's worth it the price. Uh, what will be seen here in the next 35 or 40 minutes, I warn you that should be seen as a first model, okay, our first approach to the problem. So please don't expect any fancy applications or fancy examples. Uh, instead, I will rather concentrate on presenting this first model and its first outcomes in the form of very simple model problems. Okay, so the idea is to keep it simple for the moment uh, so that we can, in a future step, go to the application. So, uh, when we are, I thought the laser pointer is going to work, but I think on this type of screen, it doesn't. When we, the mouse, perfect. When we are dealing with this, the mouse doesn't. Right? Yeah, anyway. Uh, when we are dealing with these types of problems, uh, there are some important aspects that we have to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, Obviously, particles uh, represent discrete medium, uh, whereas uh, structures are idealized as a continuum, okay? Uh, there are particle to particle, particle to structure, as well as uh, structure to structure contact, and these contacts are typically numerous. And there can be also self-contact, that is a structure can touch itself. Uh, it's very uh, uh, usual, uh, we have to deal with this. Uh, for structures here, I mean slender beams, thin shells, thin plates, membranes, and occasionally a combination of all of, the, all of these. Uh, that is to say, I mean thin, flexible structures, things that have rotational degrees of freedom and are very flexible, undergoing large deformations, large displacements, large rotations, and occasionally a local instability issue. Uh, some particularities of these types of problems, uh, these entities interact with each other and the surrounding medium permanently. Uh, contact, often with uh, friction, is typically the most uh, significant of these interactions. Uh, there is energy dissipation. Uh, in our case, we will restrict ourselves to particles that have dimensions of at least 100 microns. This is to uh, remove thermal fluctuations from the, from the uh, formulation. Uh, but on the other hand, that brings particles, uh, rotations, and spins to be uh, relevant. Uh, and by structures here, we will restrict also to those that are elastic uh, with some occasional structural damp. Uh, that said, I now come to the outline of this talk. I will first concentrate on the building blocks of our framework. Uh, that is, I will show first our particle model. That's magic. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I will first show then our particle model. Then I will show our structural model. That is how we deal with the uh, kinematics and dynamics of thin beams, thin plates, thin shells, and membranes. Actually, membranes and plates are a special case of shells. Uh, then I will move to show how these two entities here interact with, with each other. Okay, how do they talk 
to each other when the entities of one come into contact with the entities of the other. Uh, and then I will move to some uh, numerical examples, as I said, in the form of simple model problems. Uh, and then I come to close this talk with some conclusions and final considerations. So for our uh, particle model, uh, first of all, this is just one model among many possible, but it is a model that has some special features. Uh, it is, at least in our opinion, uh, simple. Uh, we make use of a special parametrization for the rotations of the particles, and also we use a special numerical solution scheme. Uh, it's a fixed point iteration uh, th uh, scheme wherein there is no system matrix. Uh, I will show that. Uh, also, as I said, the particles have dimensions uh, at least of 100 microns. So there we have these two things here. Uh, they are supposed to be dry. That is, the surrounding environment is supposed to be dry air. Uh, they are spherical and almost infinitely rigid. That is, the formations that they show experience are supposed to be very small and localized, such that we have rigid body dynamics, and this is a classical DEM scheme. Okay? Uh, so let's take a look at the uh, basic ingredient of a system of particles, which is the kinematics and dynamics of a single particle. We define some simple kinematical quantities to describe the motion from the reference to the current configuration. We follow an updated Lagrangian description of the motion. There is an inertial frame, a local body-fixed frame, uh, and we have these uh, positions and spatial orientation of the particles in the reference and in the current configuration. The rotations are described by an incremental rotation tensor, which is a function of uh, the rotation vector, the classical Euler rotation vector. Uh, it is given through the well-known Euler-Rodriguez formula here. However, we do not use these. We instead reparametrize the rotation field using this uh, special rotation vector here. The good thing of it is that the rotation tensor may be rewritten in a very convenient form, as shown here. And more importantly, we, make, we are able to compute successive rotations uh, through this simple formula here. We do not need to perform tensor operations or to use quaternions or Euler angles, nor etc. So the update of successive rotations from successive configurations is very straightforward. Uh, we have been using these in the rather different context of shells and, and beams, uh, and then moving broadly to the context of particles uh, recently. So we then define the velocities and spins and acceleration of the particles, and then we write their linear and angular momentum. And then we have the Euler laws for every particle, for a single particle, sorry, which is a function of the total forces and total moments acting on the particle. So now looking at the system of particles, we have those previous equations holding for every single particle here. Uh, and then they are total, the, these particles interact with each other in the surrounding medium. The medium is supposed to have like a, an external gravity field, external uh, electric field, and occasionally the magnetic field as, as well. And these forces are uh, given uh, through several contributions, as shown here. There are the external field forces, drag forces from the surrounding air, especially relevant if the particles travel at high speeds. Uh, we have Magnus forces, relevant if the particles have high spin. Uh, we have contact forces, of course, friction forces, adhesion forces, and occasionally uh, near field interaction. For the moment, we have only friction forces and uh, contribution from rolling resistance since we are dealing with spherical particles. So let me show very quickly each one of these force contributions. Everyone is pretty much used to this, sorry. Uh, the external field forces, this is the weight of the particle, this is the Lorentz force, then we have the drag force, make use of the standard drag equation uh, using a, a Reynolds dependent drag coefficient. Uh, for the Magnus force, we use this classic equation here, which is a function of the spin of the particle, and the relative velocity of the particle and the fluid at the particle's location. Uh, for the contact force, we follow uh, Hertz contact theory, coupled with a viscous term here to allow for energy dissipation in, normal, in the normal direction. Uh, for the friction force, we use a consistent stick-slip model of Coulomb type. That is to say, uh, we may invoke the concept of a trial stick state, assuming that first the, the uh, if the, uh, the, the particle will stick to the other particle, or an object if desired, uh, and this sticking force is given by a one-dimensional spring dashpot slider device in the tangential direction, 
uh, the stiffness of which uh, is given through a special scheme here. Uh, we compute the rolling distance of the particle by means of the rotation of its radial vector, as shown here, between successive uh, uh, configurations. And by this rolling distance, we may uh, subtract it from the total translation of the particle. And this rolling distance, we project it onto the contact plane. And this is what the amount of rolling that is applied to the spring in the tangential direction. So we verify this trial friction force against the static friction limit in standard way. In case it violates the li sliding criterion, then their uh, slipping occurs. Uh, for the adhesion forces, we make use of the classical JKR theory. Uh, we also may add a viscous term here to account for energy dissipation. Then you have to compute the net stiffness in the normal direction, taking into account the stiffness from the Hertzian spring uh, and the stiffness from the adhesion model. And finally, for the near fields forces, we follow a uh, classical uh, Leonard Jones potential type of force, which is derived like a generalized Lewis potential. Uh, for the friction moment, we simply compute it through the uh, lever arm of here. And for the rolling resistance moment, we make use of uh, the so-called elastic uh, plastic spring dash pot device. It's pretty much analogous to the friction force, except that it applies to the rotation of the particle. You have to be careful because you have to simulate the incremental uh, rolling of the particle, much as you do with the friction. Uh, all these force and moment contributions that I've just mentioned here are then plugged into the Euler laws. And then we have the initial value problem for the system. So this is a, a initial value problem that holds for every particle in the system. But the particularity here is that the forces and moment acting on every single particle are a function of the positions, velocities, angular orient orientations, and spins of every other particle of the system. So this is a very couple, uh, couple uh, system of equations. Of course, we need to resort to numerical methods to solve it. We do time, uh, numerical time integration. It's, uh, we make use of the generalized midpoint rule. Uh, this parameter here, when it equals to zero, the method amounts to an explicit forward, oil, forward Euler scheme. When it's equal to one, it's the backward Euler scheme. When it's equal to one half, it's the midpoint rule. Uh, the implementation of this is quite straightforward. Actually, I won't go over details, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a recursive uh, fixed point iteration. This is an extension of the work of a work by uh, Tarek Dodi, uh, in which we have added the rotational uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, the good thing is, as I said, there is no system matrix, simply fixed point iterations over every particle, and no rotation tensor are needed for update of the angle of the uh, ang spatial orientation of the particle. Of course, there is no free lunch. And the drawback that we, uh, the price that you have to pay is that conversion linear or mostly uh, superlinear. Uh, implementational aspect, of course, time step size, we have to cope with the Hertzian uh, duration of the contacts. Also, we have to uh, do some sort of adaptivity because this is critical for the efficiency of the solution. Uh, contact detection is obviously the bottleneck of any of such models. We make use of subdivision or bean algorithms combined with neighbor's list. Uh, so just for you to believe that the model works, I will show a couple of verification examples. Very simple, just to make, it, uh, uh, make you believe it, it, it works. This is, uh, an, this is a, a, a thing that has done experimentally by Zuri Gale et al. Uh, a bunch of particles are being dropped from a hopper onto a rigid surface. Uh, Here, uh, it's in a little bit so slow motion, but as soon as the particles start to, to hit the surface, they accumulate and they build up and start to follow to form a shallow cone uh, form uh, with a pre pretty much well defined slope. Wait for it to attain its static uh, equilibrium. And what was done is that in the physical experiment, the slope, the repose angle, was found to be 27 degrees, more or less one degree. And we were able to reproduce that very accurately. I mean, plus or less, because we have done 100 simulations and average the result. Uh, 
as I said, this is just to make you believe that the model uh, reproduces the real physics. Uh, we have also the three-dimensional version of the problem. I won't, I won't uh, spend much time on that. This is another very interesting example, very simple. We have a bunch of particles stacked in a regular pattern and shown here in a recipient, and the, the recipient is m uh, made to move vertically according to this harmonic function. And if we vibrate it according to certain frequencies, there develop some surface instabilities, and these instabilities form some well-marked waves, as you can see here, for example, and you can see here, for example, under different frequencies of excitation. So these waves, they have well-defined uh, wavelengths and amplitudes, as shown here, and in physical experiments, uh, this is a work done by uh, Professor Jacques Durin in Paris. I, I forgot to put his uh, reference here, I'm sorry. Uh, but we were able to reproduce the results very accurately as well. Uh, this is the three-dimensional version of it. You can see some sort of Cladini figures, well known for this citation of base uh, granular materials. Uh, I then I won't show some uh, uh, applications here. I don't have time for that. This would be particle infiltration into porous media. Uh, as well as uh, material jetting technologies for such as 3D printing, and I want to show these. Uh, we could add temperature effects as well. I don't want. I want to show these. And here. Now let me come to the second building block of our framework. Now, which is our structural model. Uh, so. Since we are dealing with slender beams, thin shells, membranes, thin plates, uh, there are some challenges that we have uh, overcome. Of course, we need a good kinematical description. The problem is intrinsically nonlinear. Uh, we need to deal with finite rotations in an accurate way. Uh, we have to have constitutive equations that accommodate finite strains, uh, as well as fulfill objectivity requirements. Uh, there is the presence of localized uh, instabilities. Uh, numerical locking may be an issue because thickness is supposed to be small by construction. Uh, the dynamics of these things is quite intricate. Uh, energy conservation, if desired, is also not trivial. Uh, and there can be structure-to-structure -structure contact as well, which is uh, also non-trivial. So for the kinematics of these guys, we follow a unified description. Uh, we define a reference configuration for both the beams and the shells or membranes and plates, which are a special case of these. And through these basic position vectors and rotations of the cross sections, either of the beam or of the shell, we can map their motion from the reference to the current configuration. The rotations is, are mapped uh, through this uh, rotation tensor, which I have already shown in the particle model, uh, with which uh, updates from successive configurations are very uh, straightforward. Uh, with that, with those quantities, we then compute the deformation gradient of the shell or the beam. Then we describe the stresses by means of the first pi or Kishov stress tensor. We integrate the stresses over the cross sections. We compute the cross sectional stress resultants. Uh, then we have the external forces acting on the beam in moments, on the beam and on the, on the shell. Uh, we define inertias, like this is the mass of the cross sections, this is the rotational uh, inertia of the cross section. And then we may finally compute the linear and angular momentum uh, and they, they are time derivatives, with which we are finally able to uh, plug them into the Euler laws and have the uh, equations of motion of the beam or the shell uh, written in a unified way. Okay? So, of course, this is a strong form of the equations. We are not able to solve it in strong form. We have to resort to numerical methods. Here we will follow the finite element method for which we need a weak form. We construct this weak form through the use of the virtual power theorem. Uh, and we have to compute the internal uh, strain, uh, internal forces here through some constitutive equations. Uh, we use uh, neo hook and material here, which fully uh, accommodate finite. Uh, discretization. For the beams, we use a standard linear and quadratic uh, Lagrangian element, reduced integration, whereas for the shell, we make use of a special element that we have devised a long time ago. Uh, this is a tri triangular element. It's very convenient to mesh complex geometries. And the element has the particularity of uh, 
having a quadratic field for the displacement and a linear field for the rotations. That means that the rotations, they are actually placed only at the mid-side nodes, are incompatible, and this incompatibility or non-conformity uh, fully alleviate locking. So we do not need to resort to any assumed strain or enhanced strain or reduced integration with, with uh, hourglass control uh, to overcome locking. The element is purely displacement-based, very simple, uh, and can be fully integrated. So time discretization, we perform a collocation scheme following an energy momentum approach uh, uh, embedded within the Newton's uh, iterative scheme. So for the Newton scheme, we need to linearize the, the, the weak form. I want to show this here. Uh, this is how we deal for, uh, with contact between uh, the structural elements. I mean, beams can touch each other, shells can touch each other. Uh, also, these guys can touch each other as well. We make use of a master-master approach uh, for pairs of elements. That is to say, for each uh, pair of element that is candidate to contact, uh, we follow a minimum distance problem to identify which point on each element are candidates to contact, either here or here. So once these points are uh, identified, then we compute a gap function. We evaluate this gap function. In case contact is detected, then uh, we have to add one extra term on the weak form. This is done through a standard penalty formulation, very simple. Uh, and of course, to speed up computation, we need to uh, come up with some global neighbor search prior to this local minimum distance problem. We do, do, we do that through the pinball uh, sphere. Uh, this is a work done in a collaboration with uh, colleagues of mine here. Uh, and of course, self-contact is uh, allowed. Uh, for the interaction between particles and structures, now let's uh, see how we do for particles and beams first. Uh, it's, as I said, a first approximation, okay? It's a very simple uh, uh, formulation. First of all, we restrict ourselves only to beams with circular cross-section. That is to say, cylinders, okay? With that restriction, we may idealize the beam as a series of fictitious spheres centered at each node of the finite element description of the beam. And by... Uh, Using a sufficiently fine mesh, the spheres eventually overlap and reproduce the cylindrical shape of the beam. This is done just for contact detection purposes. The, the whole kinematics of the beam is described in the way they have just shown. So it's, it is, of course, a rough approximation, but it's very efficient because contact, contact is now a sphere-to-sphere -sphere contact. There's the sphere representing the particle and the sphere representing the, the beam. Okay, very efficient. The price that we have to pay, of course, is that uh, we have to use a sufficiently fine mesh for the beam just for contact purposes. Much finer than the structural problem would require, but we don't find this to be much of a problem. Okay, uh, then we evaluate contact, the gap function here. In case contact is detected, we add one extra term on the beam's weak form and a corresponding force to the particle. So as, as I said, this is just a first approach model. We have already refined this model. I won't show results here to incorporate uh, super elliptical cross-sect or general shape beams. Uh, this is done in, co uh, in collaboration also with a colleague of mine, Alfredo. Uh, uh, co for contact between particles and shells, we make use of a node-to-surface uh, master-slave approach, pretty much uh, similar to what I have described here, except that it's not peer contact but now no to surface contact so the approach is the same we evaluate a gap function once the points are uh, in contact uh, we add one extra term to the weak form of the shell and the corresponding force to the particle uh, solution how we couple the particle problem with the structural problem uh, this is done through a couple DEM FEM staggered scheme okay we elect the finite element loop to be the, let's say, the commanding loop and embed the particle loop within it. So the algorithm is very simple. Uh, we first perform the finite element loop for time integration with Newton's iteration. We check, we check and resolve structure to structure contact. Then we check for particle beam and particle shell contact. Uh, in case they are detected, we resolve them. I mean, we compute their forces. 
And finally, we call the, fina the, the DEM loop to update the particle's positions, velocities, angles, and spins with the contact forces that, ha that have just been computed in the uh, finite element loop. Then we come back to the finite element loop, update the beams and shells positions, velocities, blah, 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 check for converg convergence, and iterate uh, in case not converged. Uh, let me show now a couple of, as I said, model problems to illustrate the formulation. It, they are very simple problems, as I have already warned you, uh, but representative of what we are trying to do. Uh, first of all, is a beam here of uh, five centimeters length, three millimeters diameter. The beam is clamped at the base and is being packed by a jet of particles, uh, high speed. So this is basically what happens. Uh, the jet of particles is diverted by the beam. The beam bends relatively a lot. There is some structural damping here. Uh, it's only one single beam. Then we move to a more complex example. Uh, we have a bigger jet of particles here uh, impacting a bunch of beams with the same uh, properties as in the previous example. And now the dynamic is a bit more intricate, as you can see. The jet uh, hits the beams, the beams bend a lot, they touch themselves and they divert the jet, the jet nearly to all directions. So another example, oh, I have long example is one moving is a single bigger particle impacting that uh, bunch of beams the beam the particle was supposed to rotate have select wrong movie I'm sorry. Not example. Uh, well let's see a, a jet of particles now impacting plate okay the plate is clamped at the base uh, it has uh, four centimeters high uh, and thickness of 0.8 millimeter, uh, uh, relatively thin plate. So the, the jet impacts the plate, the plate bends, and it diverts the jet a little bit upward. Another example, now we have a more concentrated jet impacting three parallel plates also clamped at the base. Serial properties are the same as in the previous example. And you can see a more complex interaction here. The jet is diverted by the plate. The plate touch themselves upon contact with the particles. And they have a complex. Uh, uh, here we have a jet of particles impacting a plate that is supported only at the vertex. Okay, you have support here, here only at the four corners. Okay. Uh, these are the properties, 10 centimeters long at the side, thickness 0.8 millimeters, uh, and the particles are uh, 0.5 millimeters in diameter. What have by the uh, This is an uh, example of a sieving of a granular material through uh, sieving that represented by uh, beams, okay? In the left side of the slide, you will see what happens if the sieving is idealized with uh, infinitely rigid beams. The, the sieving is, sieve is vibrating the horizontal direction, and it is able to fully, uh, almost fully uh, sieve the material. However, if we turn the beams back, this is what happens. TV Steve bends a little bit and develops some, some sort of arching effect that eventually clogs uh, the oil. Uh, this is a, a funnier example. Uh, since we are in a place that is pretty much connected to soccer, right? Uh, we have here particle representing the soccer ball, and we have here uh, the goal, which is modeled as a beam element. The frame of the goal is aluminum uh, beam elements, 12 centimeters uh, in diameter, one millimeter in thickness. It's a tube section. Uh, the net of the goal is modeled with beam elements as well, made out of nylon, a very flexible material. 
uh, and the idea is to force score. Okay, so if we put some uh, certain velocities and spin is not here, you can see what happens once the part uh, the ball is impacted on the frame. You can see a full vibration of the net here, and also on into the guy who kicked it was not so happy, of course. Spin, we add, oops, we add spin, then the particle is able to travel further uh, due to interaction with the air. It hits almost the angle of the frame, but it doesn't. A uh, funnier example of this, I have. This case here. Uh, I think some of you are familiar with this uh, attempt from a Brazilian player Pelé in the 1970 uh, FIFA's World Cup. He attempted to score from the midfield. He saw the goalkeeper a little bit ahead of the goal. He failed. This is usually called the most beautiful goal that Pelé didn't do. Uh, and some people claim that if he, he was playing in Mexico in 1970, the World Cup was in Mexico. Some people claim that if he were playing at sea level, where he were used to play, he was playing for Santos, which is by the coast, uh, he would have scored. So we did a simulation with the properties of air at sea level to check whether Pelé would have scored. And here is the result. He wouldn't. Okay. And then people say, okay, if he were in a vacuum, maybe he would score. Let's see what would happen if he were in a vacuum. He wouldn't. See, the ball doesn't lift too much because there is no Magnus force. There is no lift effect from the air to spinning. Uh, however, if Pelé had imparted a slightly less uh, lateral velocity to the ball, can see go. This is a very complicated interaction between a particle and uh, very flexible beams. You can see here. Uh, well, I'm almost not almost actually, but let me move to my uh, last slide before I go to my conclusions. Uh, I could have done this as a first slide. But I prefer to keep it at the end of the presentation. Why this work? We are interested here in these types of problems, not only, but especially now in these types of problems. The glycocalyx, I'm not sure if some of you are familiar with this, is a structure uh, that is present, observable in many types of cells uh, in the human body. They are these tiny little strands of hair that cover some of the cell membranes. Uh, and they are uh, they are there for a very specific purpose. Uh, they regulate how the cell communicates with exterior, and they basically uh, perceive uh, the presence of particles at the exterior of the cell. Particles can be lipids, can be other molecules, can be many things. Uh, they have some flexibility, some not a lot of flexibility. And this flexibility is what regulates uh, the perception of the cell with the coming of. So this is what we are interested in. We have already uh, started to apply our first model to study this problem, and also have uh, already started to put the fluid into the picture, because in the, in the end, of course, there is also the fluid phase. Uh, I want to go here, sort of hope. But now it brings me to my uh, closing remarks. Uh, we have presented a model that we hope, uh, we think it is simple, yet robust, for uh, simulation of problems wherein particles interact in flexible structures. I insist here, by structures, I don't mean 
I don't mean any type of continuum. There's very specific type of continuum, which is continuum with rotational degrees of freedom. Okay. Uh, this is just first model, as I said in the beginning. Uh, of course, improvements are possible. We are alri already working on this, uh, but it's uh, sufficiently consistent with basic uh, mechanics principles. Uh, essential ingredients of the collective behavior of particles, in fact, thin deformable uh, structures can be represented at affordable computational costs. All these simulations that I've shown here, of course, they are simple, but they were run in this laptop computer single processor, they don't take much than 30 minutes, okay? Uh, consideration of the fluid phase into the particle structure interaction, of course, is possible. As I said, this is already under work for the colleagues of mine. And of course, there are limitations. Uh, first of all, some model problems may be hard to estimate. This is this whole especially for the particle model, uh, but this is not exclusive of our model. Any particle model, for first uh, particularity. Uh, beam to particle contact may be improved. As I said, we are already working with uh, super elliptical cross sections. Uh, and also, the particle and the structural time scales may be different. So, we have to be careful with this uh, and treat it accordingly. Uh, I then come to college, uh, some of my students, some colleagues, Professor Alfredo, who is not here, Ricky Campelo, who is not here. Professor Tarek Dori, I just spoke to him, he couldn't come. Peter Vriggers, who is here. Uh, Paulo Pimenta, who couldn't come. Uh, support from official uh, Brazilian agencies. Uh, and this work started out of a long collaboration that our group is maintaining uh, with the Leibniz, Le University of Hanover, as well with, uh, with the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, I strongly uh, appreciate their our interaction with them. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the Brazilian Association for uh, Computational Methods in Engineering is promoting our annual conference. This is going to be happening within two weeks. Of course, this is a little bit uh, too much late of uh, an invitation, but I don't uh, miss the opportunity to invite you all. So it's going to be held in Natal. Still, there are some colleagues who are coming. Here, I know Professor Antonio Huerta is also coming. Uh, Eugenio was already there. Professor Vrigas was already there. Sergio was already there. Uh, and you are all invited. So with that, I thank you for it.